Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Breaking the Ice on Cold Storage Automation. This is the third in our series of webinars discussing the trends and technologies impacting supply chains and the people who run them. I'm Stephanie Hardy, Marketing Manager at Bastion Solutions, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, there are just a couple of quick announcements. We will have a live question and answer session following today's presentation, but you may submit a question at any time through the event Q&A window found on the right of your screen. Just click the My Questions tab and type your question at the bottom of the window where you see Ask a Question. We will address as many as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. If you'd like to revisit today's webinar, it will be available on the Bastion Solutions website approximately 24 hours after this live event. You will also receive an email from us with a link to the recording. All right, now on to the presentation. Discussing today's topic will be Robert Humphrey. Robert is the Manager of System Sales at Bastion Solutions, and he's based out of our Indianapolis office. He joined the company after receiving a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Missouri. He is responsible for pursuing clients for industrial automation and supply chain execution software solutions. Thank you for joining us today, Robert. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all for joining us. I'm very honored and excited to present today the convenient distribution of refrigerated and frozen foods we consume on a daily basis is an underappreciated luxury. It's an industry segment that operates mostly in the background of our lives, unnoticed by the consumer. The intricate process of getting food from farm to fork must run quickly and efficiently. As Stephanie mentioned, please submit questions via the comment button and we'll do our best to answer the questions at the end. With that said, let's get started. Today's presentation will cover the high level current state on the refrigerated and cold storage industry, as well as discuss the most common technologies used to automate these facilities. As the title suggests, this is going to be a high level overview and introduction on the topic. We'll have more content in the future, diving deeper into some of the areas we'll highlight today. Automating a cold storage operation has common considerations such as your unique operational requirements, technology selection, and building style. Without careful consideration, you may be exposed to high operational and labor costs that come with a cold storage facility. We'll discuss the best course of action when automating your cold storage operation. As with any dynamic and growing industry, it's important to understand the current trends and how they give way to challenges for those trying to run a competitive and efficient organization. First, what is the cold chain? At the most generic level, we have a network of food growers or producers, as well as storage, transportation, and distribution providers, which ensures the fresh and frozen foods get, from, get to consumers safe, fresh, and conveniently. Frozen food supply is heavily reliant on managing the process of refrigerating, freezing, and defrosting, so the goods are strictly managed throughout this process from farm to consumer. When it comes to refrigerated and frozen storage facilities, the four most common types are pre-production, hub, distribution center, and post-production. Pre-production facilities are typically close to the side of raw materials, potentially plant attached. From here, the next phase of the process would be to a hub, which would serve a much broader customer base. After the hub, goods would continue towards a distribution center. This distribution center might be for a major retailer or could still be for a producer within their own network. Packaging automation and sortation equipment are common at these facilities. A post-production facility would be the final stop before reaching the consumer or retailer. These are located within their own respective markets they are serving. As you can imagine, this supply chain is inherently inefficient. It's not always feasible to locate large production sources or raw materials close to major markets, and it's also not always feasible for producers to have small-scale distributed production centers. Back in July, the Center for Urban Education about Sustainable Agriculture estimated that the average meal in the U.S. travels 1,500 miles from farm to plate. Producers are under a lot of pressure to evaluate where their products are produced versus where they're consumed. Obviously, the further away from the consumer, the more points in the supply chain before being consumed. Producers are looking to have access to a widespread, diverse network. Increasing popularity of online food sales, in addition to surges in demand, are putting pressure on speed. 
As engineers, when it comes to understanding a complex problem, we always start with the data. So let's look at some data to get a good foothold. So as a starting point for understanding the trends and growth within this market, I want to highlight historical data that is collected and published by the USDA. On a monthly basis, they collect and publish end of month stock of meat, dairy, fruits and vegetables in public and private refrigerated warehouses. These items that you see here are all commodities and don't include many of the things in our refrigerators and freezers, such as prepared meals, frozen pizzas or bakery type items. You can see on each of these graphs the seasonality for these items as we consume more or less of them throughout the year. You can also see clear year over year growth. The, the darker lines are more recent years. This presents an obvious challenge for storage providers as the amount of inventory as well as the relative speed of that product changes throughout the seasons. The month to month change is fairly consistent year over year, just steadily growing. Summarizing that data into total refrigerated and total frozen on a year over year basis, you can clearly see the growth trend. I've excluded some of the seasonal products such as fruits and vegetables from the total freezer volume. The average year over year growth from the start of this period from January 2018 up until this past month was 1.6% for freezer and 3.8% for cooler. Space isn't the only thing that's important. The number of inventory turns per year is also increasing. Now, I want to share some additional data points with you to help continue setting this scene. Americold Realty Trust is an owner and operator of temperature controlled warehouses with more than 180 warehouses in its network. It's the largest publicly traded company within the space. So I'm going to pick on Americold a little bit here only because as a publicly traded company, they share key metrics of their business with investors and within filings with the SEC. As they're a very large operator within the space, they're a good proxy towards what's happening within the segment as a whole. Some of the interesting key details that they share about their business within their filings are the number of physical occupied pallets they had within the quarter, as well as the number of throughput pallets. Now, both of these are fundamental for their business as they earn revenue from storing the pallets, which goes towards their rent and storage revenue, as well as from the movement of the pallet, which goes towards their service revenue. The ratio of these two metrics effectively becomes the number of inventory terms they have within their network. So this first graph here, you can see the total throughput is consistently increasing. This graph here, this is for total within the same store and their non same store segment. Uh, one thing that's particularly interesting about this is the first quarter of the year is typically one of the lighter quarters for them in terms of throughput. As you can see in 2018 and 2019, Q1 was much lighter than the other quarters of that year. Um, as you can see in Q1 of 2020, there was a massive increase in the total throughput compared to Q1s of prior years. This increase was driven by accelerated consumer spending on refrigerated and frozen foods as people were stocking up. Getting back to my previous point about the ratio of the physical pallets and storage and the throughput, you can see that the ratio is also increasing. It might be a bit hard to distinguish on, on this graph. Again, the, the darker lines are more recent years um, overlaid quarter over quarter. So clearly the velocity of the product is increasing. Um, and this, this particular graph is just within the same store segment of their, of, their, um, of their business. So it's not comparing against new facilities they might be bringing online. Consolidating all of this into the totals for the year within their same store segment alone, the total number of inventory turns is steadily increasing year over year for them, um, about one to two percent per year. So this this coupled with the USDA data paints an important picture of what's happening within the industry. The capacity for inventory and the velocity are both increasing. Analysts expect the cold storage sector to grow at a compound annual growth rate of four and a half percent by 2023 as the demand is ever increasing. The sector obviously is going to experience pressure for growth just based purely on, on population increase. Um, the, the industry's grown, 
the industry's growth has has shown to outpace population growth um, by a significant margin. There's increased demand for some pre-prepared products, as an example, vegetables. Pre-prepared vegetables accounted for 91% of the share for fruits and vegetables globally in 2017. 91% of, of fruits and vegetables was, was, just, um, was just the pre-prepared vegetables. The advantage over fruit being that most vegetables don't require thawing, which increases their convenience of use for the consumer. There's a greater need to increase the shelf life of goods and invest in the technology that will enable this. So as technology that's used within the space becomes more capable, better connected, better controlled, it will unlock new business opportunities. This industry is unlike others and has unique challenges to overcome. By far the highest energy demand compared with uh, any, any other industrial facility or warehouse space. Um, a huge barrier to entry is the building itself as it's almost always built to suit. High performance um, for these facilities is extremely crucial. So unlike a conventional warehouse, you'll never see builders throwing up spec buildings for these types of spaces. Everyone uh, is facing labor shortages and this industry is no different um, from others with that regard. Uh, this, the associates working within these facilities must be highly trained as they're working with heavy industrial equipment and sometimes inside a deep freezer environment. So the challenge presented is they're much less efficient as they can't stay in the freezer environment for very long, which hurts productivity for the operation. So let's talk about each one of these in a bit greater detail. First, the amount of energy used in these facilities is off the charts compared to any other industrial space. For example, Walmart, who we're all familiar with, stated in 2018 that their refrigeration systems consume anywhere from 30 to 50% of the energy use of all of their buildings. The amount of energy used in these facilities can be staggering. This means that it's incredibly important for them to be high performance facilities and as dense and as efficient as possible. On the construction side, as I mentioned earlier, these high performance buildings are always built to suit. Here are some of the things that builders are saying. The speed to market is huge. It's like an arms race. Automated material handling systems, mixed case palletizing and piece picking for home delivery will be integral. There's a push in the grocery distribution for automation given the speed to market required. There's significant barriers to entry in this sector as there is a substantial investment, a substantial initial investment cost for the construction. This makes it very difficult for smaller operators to break into the market or compete with some of the larger companies. The cost to build a cold storage facility is typically two to three times um, a conventional warehouse. And the average age for cold storage facilities in the US is 34 years. The market demand for frozen and refrigerated goods is growing. The industry was growing prior to COVID and the growth in demand has been increased tremendously as the food supply source shifted during COVID. Some of you might recall that back in March and April of this year, most, most retailers were sold out of chest and upright freezers. Another thing is the variance of products is getting higher. Companies are reliant on the traceability from farm to fork and the consumers are extremely conscientious of how the food is produced and it's very important to them. The order profile, the order profiles from retailers to producers and distributors have also shifted. So products are being purchased in smaller quantities within that order and the wider range of variety within the order is pushing high demands on the automation. So with, with all the background information on how this industry is changing and some of the biggest challenges they're facing, let's discuss some of the common considerations as you're looking to automate your operation. The first would be operational considerations. Many items specific to your unique operation can impact your ability to automate. Do you have multiple temperature storage zones you need to maintain, for example, a cooler and a freezer? How many shifts or hours do you need to run? What does your typical order profile look like? Are orders primarily in full pallet quantities? Do you have full layer orders and the need for mixed layer building? What about case level orders? Your facility's location is another important factor. 
the location can greatly impact your access to the necessary labor market. Labor costs can be a huge driver towards automation as the low temperature environment means associates have a limited amount of time in the freezer. Productivity and efficiencies in general become much lower compared to a conventional warehouse. Your facility's location can also influence the type of system configuration you could have. Due to the high operational costs, you'll want to utilize your vertical cube to the best of your ability. Building as tall as possible is extremely common for these types of systems. If you're too close to a major airport or a city where the municipality might limit your building height, um, it, it's something else that could impact your, your uh, configuration. Based on the height that you plan to build, are there certain building setback lines on your property that might impact the ideal configuration for your site? Based on the operational considerations, the next important consideration is the building style. So as discussed uh, earlier, cooler and freezer warehouses are almost always built to suit. They're high performance buildings and they're specialty builders that focus solely on this type of construction. So based on your operation, if fully automated pallet movements is something that would suit your operation, you may be looking at a rack supported structure. This type of structure enables you to build much higher than a conventional building at a better price point and also enables better cubic density within the storage racking as there's no building columns. If an automated pallet storage system is something that would suit your operation, you typically want to build as tall as possible. If your system would not benefit from fully automated pallet movement, a conventional building that is designed for your freezer or refrigerator requirements would be suitable. An additional challenge that some in the industry face is around flexibility. As your product mix changes over time, the required storage temperature could change as well. If this is a risk for your business, you might want to consider a convertible style building that could operate at different temperatures if you need to change it in the future. Uh, maybe set up as refrigerated space now and could be converted to a freezer in the future. Um, naturally, the, in, any equipment, the automation equipment would also need to be designed to suit that change. When it comes to technology suited for cold storage automation, nearly all typical equipment you see in a conventional warehouse can also be found in freezer warehouses. The equipment being designed with the temperature environment in mind means it's almost always more expensive. I'm going to touch on the most common types of equipments found in these in these warehouses and why. First, as it's most common for goods to be moved at the pallet or unit load level, any type of pallet material handling equipment is common. In some operations, goods may be received to the facility at the case level, but would most likely be palletized to be moved more efficiently throughout the operation. Depending on the operation, the goods may be stored in static racking within a low bay conventional freezer building. Um, if the throughput or inventory is high enough, the pallets may be stored within an automated system. The system may utilize stacker cranes or potentially pallet shuttles to facilitate the storage and retrieval. For smaller, lighter goods, uh, like cases, a mini load crane or a case shuttle may be used. These can help rapidly retrieve and sequence goods as they're fed to downstream processes for mixed case palletizing and order fulfillment. Automated forklifts or AGFs are also of extreme interest within this industry as some of the larger operators already have dozens of facilities within their network, existing equipment and infrastructure, and they're looking to make the next step at optimizing their operation. They can't massively overhaul their facilities and their inventory might not move fast enough to fully benefit from a fully automated storage and retrieval system. An automated forklift can be a great improvement for these operations without requiring massive overhaul or investment. Finally, full layer picking is another technology that's made its way into the cold storage environments. This type of technology can pick one or more layers off of a pallet simultaneously to build a rainbow pallet based on the customer's order. These types of systems come in many different flavors, but the general principle is the same for all. As customers are trending more towards less than pallet orders, ordering more at a layer level, this technology enables you to provide your customer with additional value added services without additional labor demand. A key underlying attribute for equipment used in these types of environments is they're extremely robust, heavy duty, and reliable. 
Maintenance and downtime within a negative 20 degree environment will not be acceptable. As Stephanie mentioned in the intro, I'm based out of the Indianapolis area and our winters here are, are pretty typical Midwest winter and it can, it can get pretty cold. In 2019, the coldest day of the year was January 30th. And on January 30th of 2019, it got down to negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit, or if you think more in terms of Celsius, that's negative 24 degrees. I remember this distinctly because on January 30th of 2019, I was returning back to Indianapolis. I'd been in the LA area that week at a customer site and my car had been parked at the airport during the coldest week and the coldest day of the year. When I went to the airport earlier in that week, it was already really cold. And I remember when I turned my car on that morning to head to the airport, it started up just a little bit slower. I hadn't had any issues up to this point. Um, the battery was a couple of years old, maybe two or three years old. Um, so it was getting it was getting there where it was going to need replaced, but I hadn't hadn't had any issues up to this point. And I remember on my way to the airport when I turned it on, it was just a tad bit slower than typical. Um, at this point, I had I had no choice. It's 5 a.m. I'm headed to the airport. I have a flight to catch. There's nothing I can do about it now. Um, and when I returned back to the Indianapolis airport several days later, I remember the dreaded bus ride back to my parked car. Um, when I got back to my car, sure enough, it, it didn't turn over even even one time. It was totally dead. Now, fortunately, the airport has um you know staff of people and they provide jump service so i called the number and within you know five to ten minutes someone came out and, and uh got me on my way on my way back home from the airport i stopped at an auto zone i'm just going to buy a new battery um, they normally can help you swap it out or you know test the battery itself to see if it needs recharged or if it needs replaced um and i remember the uh the attendant at auto zone saying that um they weren't even allowed to go outside to help customers during this time period because of how cold it was. It was a, a corporate policy of theirs. And I'll never forget how cold it was just during the few minutes with the simple task of changing the battery on my car. Your fingers hurt. You can't move your hands at all. Um, and this was at negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And some of these some of these facilities are running at negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit, negative 30 and lower. So I, I always I always remember that and always keep that in mind. Um, Another consideration is your equipment could experience condensation buildup, uh, freezing or fogging based on where it's located within the facility, as there might be certain temperature gradients uh, at locations near near doors um, or anywhere where, where you know you know you might be next to the uh, the cooler portion um, of your of your facility. It might require that you use heated lenses or heated enclosures to ensure that any optical sensors work properly. Another key attribute is energy efficiency. Ultimately, energy used by the material handling equipment is put into your facility as heat. And the amount of heat load generated by the equipment into the freezer is a very important consideration. Not only are the operational costs for the facilities already very high due to the refrigeration requirements, the additional energy to power the automation, as well as the amount of heat load generated into your facility can become taxing. The most innovative manufacturers have been working to optimize the energy use of their machines. So as an example, on a stacker crane that moves both vertically and horizontally, they can use a common drive link and a, a common drive link and a, a single power supply and a single power module for both drives. So this allows one movement uh, to benefit from the regenerative energy of the other in real time. So as an example, um, when the crane is traveling and also lowering, as you can see in the graph, strategies can be deployed to optimize the energy use within this cycle without increasing the cycle time. So taking it uh, further, there's also been some additional developments that have been made to store any surplus regenerative energy that's captured during the cycle that might not have been consumed immediately. It can be stored and then used by the system in the future. Another technology that's becoming increasingly popular in the space is the use of an oxygen reduction system or hypoxic air technology. For large systems that have many pallets in storage, a considerable amount of that space might be occupied by fire suppression pipes and sprinklers. So under certain scenarios and for certain designs, these can be eliminated in favor of using an active fire protection technique where the baseline oxygen level in the facility is a very, very low concentration. 
a traditional fire suppression system, a fire is extinguished after it's detected, whereas hypoxic air technology is able to prevent fires from starting. So this, this can equate to a huge increase in your storage density. Finally, integrated software is the key to a successful automated material handling system. As an independent integrator, we offer complete scalable warehouse software solutions that can be implemented as individual components. Our software suite can interface with any host system and it can even be implemented as a complete solution. So as a result, Xacta provides increased flexibility in technology selection, reduced inefficiencies, and it also provides powerful analytics to monitor labor and automation equipment. As a gold Microsoft partner, we've demonstrated a best in class ability and commitment to meet Microsoft customers evolving needs in today's dynamic business environment and distinguish ourselves within that top 1% of Microsoft partner ecosystem. As we're wrapping up, I want to recap some of the benefits of automation. Automation reduces expenses and costs for labor, especially if you run your system in a three shift operation. As these facilities already have such high operating costs, eliminating labor expense is key. It can be difficult to hire suitable employees due to the demanding environment and high qualification needed. There's other benefits as well once you've relieved your dependence on the labor. One, one thing that can provide tremendous benefit is the use of reduced oxygen in the storage environment to eliminate the need for in-rack fire suppression piping and sprinkler heads. The, the, the drive there is the facility operators, they don't want to be paying for frozen space that they can't utilize for storage. So optimizing the density is, is key for them. Automation also helps create ergonomic workplaces. As an example, leveraging goods to person technologies, ergonomic handling equipment or picking tools. So automation is, is needed to help drive efficiencies in this inherently inefficient supply chain. Overall transformational business activity is very high as a lot of companies are rapidly adjusting their supply chains. We, we have an in-house consulting staff of highly trained and experienced individuals working with our clients on these endeavors. Our consulting group exists to provide support for companies looking to improve their supply chain operations. Using detailed research, extensive data analysis and creative concept development, strategic, rec strategic recommendations are presented based on your business goals and requirements. Our consulting services can be engaged at any stage in any project. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time. This concludes the presentation. I hope you found it informative and I'll turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you, Thanks. Robert. Great presentation. We are now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, you can still ask a question at any time using the Q&A window on the right of your screen. Simply click the My Questions tab and type your question at the bottom of the window where it says Ask a Question. And it does look like we have a few that have already come in, so we will go ahead and get started with the first one. Um, all right, so Robert, how big of an operation to where it makes sense to automate? This is a this is a great question. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of variables to consider that could be specific to your to your application. Um, but in the most general sense, we typically see that a pile of around 15,000 pallets is the, the minimum threshold for it to make financial sense for automated storage. Um, there could be certain attributes about your operation that could change this threshold, um, such as really high velocity or a lot of layer or case handling. Um, but, but typically we'd say around around 15,000 pallets. All right, very good. Very good. Um, the um, next the question, question is, is how, how high, high can you build? build? Is there is a there recommendation or sweet spot? Um, for rack supported structures, the limiting factor um, that I've typically seen is probably the height of the ASRS crane um, and how much sway the building might have for a certain height. Um, so it, that, it's usually around 150 to 155 feet is the is the tallest that I'm, I'm aware of. Okay. 
the next question is, it looks like you mentioned construction costs can be two to three times I'm guessing more. So what does this equate to? Yeah, another good question. Um, the typical construction costs for cold storage facilities, um, they're around, around $180 a square foot for high bay and around $120 a square foot for low bay. So we typically use um, we typically use that as as recommended guidelines for how much to budget uh, 180 180 dollars a square foot for high bay and 120 for low bay. All right, thank you. The next question: How much more expensive is freezer rated equipment? Yeah, it, it it typically is more expensive. It depends a lot, obviously, on the piece of equipment. Um, typically, around I would say 15 to 25 percent more expensive than the an equivalent piece of equipment designed for an ambient environment. All right, looks like we have a couple more here. Uh, what is the coldest temperature you've done a project for? Um, around negative 20 is pretty typical. I, we've looked at certain pharmaceutical applications that went down to negative 40, so that's probably the coldest that I've seen. All right, um, I think this might be our last question. Uh, how do I decide if I should plan for rack supported building or conventional? And is it just based on building height or is it number of pallets in storage? So there's a number of things that come into play. Um, as a good rule of thumb around 60 feet is a good threshold where you're, you're going to want to start looking at, um, at rack supported sometimes in certain high seismic areas, it might drive you towards rack supported at a much lower height than that. All right, well, that looks like it's all of the questions for today. Uh, so that was a good one to end on. We would like to thank all of our attendees for their participation and to Robert for a great webinar and an engaging Q&A. Um, on behalf of Bastion Solutions, thank you for attending today's event. We do invite you to join us for our last webinar uh, next week, uh, Hyperlocal Fulfillment 101, Permanent Changes in Buying Behavior. Have a great afternoon, everyone.